writing is unique among the arts in that it survives death. Painting does, dance and theater, any performative art doesn't, but writing, if my father had just been a, a successful accountant, I wouldn't have that access. And so writing was a way for me to, it was a way for him to live on because I could access these journals and he could come to life. And then by writing, putting him into words that, that would presumably outlive me, then I can keep that going. I am thrilled to welcome you to this evening's literary program featuring local best-selling memoirists, Alicia Abbott and Howard Axelrod. When I remember my father, Steve Abbott, now, I mostly remember his innocence, his sweetness, his gentle manner. He wasn't tough. None of the tragedy he'd known, losing his wife in a car accident, feeling rejected by family and lovers, None of that had hardened him in any way that I could tell. His hands were soft. He had pale skin and freckles. He burned easily in the sun and so generally avoided it. As a little girl, home from first grade and resigned to cozying up to the television for company as dad worked on his poems and cartoons, I developed a crush on Mr. Rogers. He was so like my dad with his slender shoulders, brown hair, and light eyes, the careful way he removed his loafers and laced his sneakers, his gentle manner of speaking and of inviting you into his life. Every day, Mr. Rogers sang me a song, and every day I answered him, yes, I will. I will be your neighbor. You could hear Nebraska whenever my father opened his mouth. <clears throat> His conversations were peppered with folksy sayings and examples of the dry wit he'd admired in his grandma folk. Widowed young and never remarried, she cared for her two children on a school teacher's salary and helped raise my father until my grandfather returned from the Second World War. If you burn yourself, she used to tell him, you gotta sit on a blister. I used to tease him <clears throat> the way he pronounced cafe, cafe, the way he called the remote control the clicker, or the way he called every pasta dish we ate spaghetti, instead of differentiating between linguine, fettuccine, and angel hair, as I'd learned to do, a San Francisco sophisticate, when my dad said okie dokie and smiled his toothy grin, it sounded old-fashioned and silly. Sometimes his more literary friends made fun of him. They laughed when at a fancy dinner, dad told him a story about his childhood dog, Sparky. But the quirkiness of his speech, as much as I teased him for it, just made him more of the dad I loved. Dad's sweetness and easy manner charmed people and animals. Whenever we were at a party or at someone's house for dinner, whatever cat was around would inevitably end up on my dad's lap, purring away while he stroked its fur absentmindedly. At many of these parties, I was the cat, always drawn to his lap, always calmed by his breathing, his vibrating chest and soft voice. And on his lap, he would also pet me with those gentle, loving hands. I have pictures of him at age eight. His parents used to drive him and his younger sister from Lincoln to Denver every summer. In Estes Park, you could feed chipmunks with peanuts sold by the bag at the park entrance. <clears throat> In one picture, he's crouched perfectly still with his hand balanced on a boulder, his finger outstretched, clasping a peanut, and at the end of that peanut, a tiny chipmunk nibbles away while my father looks content. And in the background, his younger sister, Elaine, is in bangs and pigtails, her mouth open in mid-complaint. No matter how much she tried to tempt the chipmunks with her swaying peanut, they were always drawn to dad. As a child, I loved looking at pictures of my father's boyhood in Lincoln. There he is riding a tricycle, there he is playing Pony Express and circus with the neighborhood kids. The scenes of my father captured so diligently by Grandpa Abbott looked to me right out of the shows that aired in rerun every afternoon, Leave It to Beaver, Father Knows Best. Grandpa Abbott scribbled titles on the photo backs. Dancing Steve, First Communion, Taking Time Out for Refreshments. These titles unwittingly masked a quiet unhappiness that I only understood after reading my father's journals. 
When some people age, you can see a history of disappointment in their face and posture. A smile is creased in the corner as though it painfully swallowed an unpleasant truth. Sad eyes slant and sag, cheeks grow pale, shoulders slump as if, we're, as if weary from carrying the burden of grief, guilt, or some unresolved hurt. But look at the photo of the same person as a child and you might see someone completely different. Someone full of lightness and joy and that peculiar, almost stupid hope that can come from inexperience. My grandmother talked about that stupid hope. It was maybe for this reason that she avoided looking at pictures of herself when she was young. I once asked her about a wedding portrait, which she didn't find until after, we didn't find until after she died. I don't know where it is, she said. I think I saw it once and thought, that stupid girl, she doesn't know what she's in for. My father, he didn't know what he was in for as a grown up, but that stupid hope came later. In pictures of him as an adult in San Francisco with his arms slung around the neck of a young boyfriend or pulling me onto his lap in a cluttered apartment kitchen, he looks relaxed, almost giddy, posed among a group of illustrious writers in the basement of City Lights Bookstore. He appears content and proud. Standing on Haight Street in his beard fedora, 1940s top coat, he looks in his element like a king surveying his lands, unaware of the invaders at the gate. You find a different Steve in the Nebraska pictures. As a three-year-old, he looks uncertain. As a child of seven, he's often looking away while his sister's smiling. In another photograph, a close-up of him in an Indian headdress, in his eyes there's an aggressive snarl that seems deeper than any pretend play. In his pictures with his parents, I rarely see affection. His body is stiff next to his mother in a parking lot in Colorado, both of them looking away as though trying to find their real families. My father never officially came out to his parents. Helen and Jean Abbott learned their son was gay by reading a letter dad had written to his brother, which had been left out on the table by accident. But they had long been suspicious. Dad wasn't able to be himself his true self, his naked and profane self, until he left Lincoln for Atlanta and then San Francisco. Once my father came out, he was fully out. He could never go back in. So I, I like to sometimes read that um, section because I feel when I do, it feels like I bring my father kind of into the room with me. And, um, you know, often, uh, this book came out in 2013, a couple of years ago, and whenever I do interviews, often when I do interviews, the same, some questions come up again and again. One is, uh, why did you write this book? And then the other one is, why did it take you, your dad died in 1992, your book published in 2013, why did it take you over 20 years to write this book? Um, when I was, uh, Right before I wrote the book proposal uh, for Fairyland, I read uh, an essay actually from a, a lecture by Margaret Atwood called Negotiating with the Dead. It was very inspiring to me at the time. But in it, she talks about sort of the peculiar habits of writers, the peculiar preoccupation that we have. Basically, you know, to, go, to want to go down into the underworld to go down to visit the dead, maybe learn some of their lessons, and then come up to the surface and share those lessons with other people. But as if any of us know who have studied mythology, you know, going into the underworld is dangerous business. Orpheus went down to the underworld to retrieve his young bride, Eurydice, because he felt that she'd been taken too young and he couldn't stand to have her gone, but was told there was a rule he could not look back on the, on the walk up. And once he did, she was lost to him forever. I think for those of us, for me, my, my father died when I was just 
uh, four days short of my 22nd birthday, I felt he was gone from me too soon. I had a desire to retrieve him, to get him back, to make him real again on the page. In fact, you know, when you start a, a book, you have a, a shifting array of goals for the book. In the way beginning, you might say, I hope this book wins a Pulitzer Prize. I hope this book is the National Book Critics Circle Award winner. And then at some point, you sort of bring down your expectations. And then for me, it was like, I, I really, I want this book to capture my dad. I want to feel that I can read something and it'll feel like him. And if four people, two people, one person reads that and says, I really feel like I know your father, I love your father after reading that book, that will feel like an accomplishment to me. But the matter of getting there, of finding a way to go down and to bring him back up in a way safely, that's dangerous business. The fear about going into the underworld, I think, when you're revisiting the dead, and I had the unique uh, uh, opportunity because my father left these journals and these letters that detailed his everyday life and his everyday thoughts and concerns. So when I went to read these, I really felt I was traveling through history, I felt I was in conversation with him. But when you go down in there, meaning, you know, for me to spend all that time, it was, there's a fear, I think, of becoming overwhelmed by grief, by madness. I mean, that seems overwrought, but there's a sense of this is, I don't know if I'm up for this. And you want to do it right because you don't get that many chances. And so for me, part of the reason it took me so long was that fear of, of going down and really spending time down there, really having faith, really sitting with those journals and letting myself be engulfed in this history and then coming back up and being ready to not look back again. And um, I mean, that's one of the other things that Margaret Atwood pointed out in her essay is writing is unique among the arts in that it survives death. Painting does, dance and theater, any performative art doesn't. But writing, if my father had just been a, a successful accountant, I wouldn't have that access. And so writing was a way for me to it was a way for him to live on because I could access these journals and he could come to life. And then by writing, putting him into words that, that would presumably outlive me, then I can keep that going. Um, I'm going to read just one more quick bit and then I'm going to pass it over to my very able um, panelist here. I was a junior in, in college studying abroad I'd known that he was HIV positive, and, all, and, and I knew he had ARC at some point, but all that was very vague to me via letter. I didn't know what it meant. I didn't really want to know. I loved him, but I really just wanted to be in college. And so he comes to visit me um, in Paris. I, I'd later find out against the wishes of his doctor. <clears throat> My father was a rich man in Paris. In San Francisco, we'd skimped and saved. No piece of furniture was, brought, was bought new. Everything was found at garage sales or marked down, as were our clothes. But in Paris, my father was loose with his francs, buying any blouse or dress that caught my fancy. I'd like to see you in nice clothes, he told me, as I posed and turned in the shop mirrors. We went out every night and he barely looked at the check before spreading his francs like Monopoly money across the tabletop. What my father didn't spend that week, he put in an envelope and handed to me before taking a cab to catch his flight home to San Francisco. There was this feeling, we're in Paris. This world is not our world. This is not real money, why worry? But on our first afternoon together in Paris, when we met for a coffee in Montmartre, I didn't yet know this flush side of my dad. 
I explained to him how it was cheaper to take a coffee standing at the bar than to sit at a table. I was still tight with money, still used to being a student. But he wanted to sit. His legs were tired. He was easily tired that trip. So we sat on the terrace outside. The sun was shining, so every other seat was taken. The cobblestone streets were stacked with parked motos, the Vespas that young Parisians drove everywhere. The angry wasp buzz of their engines echoed through the neighborhood, narrow alleys and hills. We sat at the Café des Abbes across from a blinking merry-go-round. The trees were in bloom, the summer air warmed me, and I felt good. Our plan was to walk up to Sacré-Cœur, but Dad didn't know if he was up for the hill and the many flights of stairs. It's not, it's not far from here, I said, splitting a cube of sugar for my espresso. He sat, tapping the saucer of his café creme with his narrow, cigarette-stained fingers. That's OK, he said, looking at the table. I, I suggested we go to the Musée d'Orsay, my favorite Paris museum, still my favorite, the next day. That semester, I'd studied 19th century history along with the French realist writers Flaubert and Balzac, and I enjoyed seeing the art of that period against the literary and historical context I knew so well. That's OK, he said again. He'd already seen the Musée d'Orsay, just as he'd already seen Notre Dame and the Musée Picasso and the Place des Vosges and everywhere else that I suggested we visit. I've seen them all, he said. Then after a pause added, I'm here to see you. He spoke his words calmly as he sipped his café creme, and for a moment, I felt uncomfortable. Just as many times in my life, my father's love left me feeling uncomfortable. How at 13 I had snarled, what are you looking at? When I caught him grinning at me with big eyes across the dinner table. And he had answered, I'm just amazed that I've raised this beautiful young woman. His love always surprised me. It could be jarring because it would spring from nowhere and certainly seemed to have no relationship to my actions. It was as though my father loved me for just sitting there in front of him, before his eyes, and returning his gaze, listening to him and speaking. This was how he looked at me that day at the cafe. It was too easy. Thank you. Uh. I lived in solitude for nearly two years in northern Vermont and the Northeast Kingdom. And um, so just so you have a sense of the house where I lived and what it was like there, I'm going to read a little bit of the prologue to orient you and hopefully disorient you, um, which will be your orientation. The house wasn't something you stumbled upon by accident. It wasn't something you passed going anywhere else. To get there, you drove through Glover, Vermont, a general store, no traffic light, one busy bee diner, climbed along switchbacks through maples, evergreens, and birches, then turned left onto a wide dirt road. You passed the barn and blue silo of the Moreland Dairy Farm, snaked past a few scattered houses and trailers, then followed deeper into the woods, the maples tapped, tubed, and strung together like prisoners on a chain gang, as it was early March now, sugar season. A few miles in, at a mailbox nobody used, you forked off the wide dirt road onto an unmaintained narrow lane, the deeper snow tugging at your car as though part of a different gravity. You slipped through a tunnel of overhanging trees, came to an empty field bordered by tall pines, then passed an uninhabited house, its siding job left unfinished, then followed as the road dwindled into what seemed only the ghost of a road. No car tracks but your own, the twin trail in the snow behind you, like a vestige of the two ruts in summer, when the weeds between them would grow taller than your hood. A small meadow opened on your left, three gnarled apple trees glimmering in the sunlight like chandeliers, and beyond the meadow was the beginning again of forest, with little promise of a house at all. From there, just inside the buried fence posts, you walked, and at the bottom of the steep grade, 
with its sky blue paint flaking, its lines badly canted, sat the two story house like a sunken ship. Not much from the outside world found me there. In the year and a half since I'd moved in, there had never been a knock on the door. I had no television, no computer, no cell phone. There was a landline which rang maybe twice a month, so a wrong number was an event. As for other news, the yellowing issues of the Newport Chronicle, stacked in the corner by the wood stove, reported on beaver problems, church suppers, DWI charges, and missing dogs, but all from years past. Sometimes, kindling the fire's embers at dawn, I'd find myself wondering about a handsome spotted pointer, or the cutest darn black mutt you ever saw. But then I'd notice the newspaper's date. Those dogs had lighted out for their canine dreams two summers earlier, long before the snows. So that gives you a little sense of, of where I was. Um, needless to say, I didn't do a lot of entertaining. And I also didn't get out much for entertainment. I only got out really to get food. Uh, I was often snowed in, so that would happen about once, sometimes once every 10 days, sometimes once every two weeks, um, because the road I lived on was unmaintained. So there was no, occasionally a man would come and, and plow, but often he didn't come plow. So I just had to wait. Um, and when I would go to get food, I would go into the nearby town. It would take me maybe 15 or 20 minutes to get there. And the, the market there was called the CNC. It was maybe an eight market, an eight aisle market. Which, and that was always sort of an adventure just to be out again, to see the few people I might see, to hear the music that would play and the, the speakers, the pop radio station that would play. For whatever reason, supermarket music always seems to be Whitney Houston and Elton John, where, wherever you are. So that, to go from the quiet of the snow and just hearing birds to hearing Rocket Man was always uh, alarming. Um, anyway, so I, but I, I didn't see people very often. Um, so I'm going to come back into the prologue here. Uh, and that, that, that's what's been set up, that I live deep in the woods and I don't see people. So on that moonless March night, when three raps came at the mudroom door, surprise wasn't the word for my response. Each rap sounded alarmingly inside the house, hardening the posts and beams into place. A current ran through my body, a rattling physical charge. The blue candle guttered on the table. It seemed I was underwater and something was bobbing on the surface far above me. In the darkened windows to the woods, the reflection of my dinner flickered soft and shadowy, more the idea of a dinner than anything solid, and my image flickered just the same. On my weekly trip to the C and C, I was prepared, knowing I would be seen. Reflections, however glancing, would be cast back at me from the checkout girl snapping her gum, hippie, from the bulky matrons trundling their carts, drifter. Reflections bearable because they seemed so obviously wrong. But the thought of someone there, as close as the mudroom door, was like a mirror flashed close to my face. A man alone, a barely furnished room, a candle on the table. The scene like an ancient interrogation, but with no visible interrogator. The downstairs bathroom did have a mirror, but I never confronted it. Not brushing my teeth, not washing my face, not stepping out of the shower. Not because I minded my face itself, or even my blind right eye, which had developed a pearly green cataract since my accident, but because the gaunt 25-year-old man in the mirror was no one I recognized. A figure was there, a physical presence, but he followed me only at a distance. Even keeping a journal had come to feel strange, as though I was trying to sketch my own outline, to corral the wind, the snow, and the stars into the shape of a man. Coming to the woods hadn't been an exercise or a retreat. It wasn't something to take notes on and jar for later, like summer berries. I needed to live without the need of putting on a face for anyone, including myself. I needed to be no one, really, while carrying the hope that my particular no one might feel familiar, might turn out to be someone I had known all along, the core of who I'd been as a boy, the core of who I might become as a man. Beneath all the masks I'd accumulated over the years, 
beneath even the masks that resented those masks, there had to be something there, something essential, some sense of reality and of myself that couldn't be broken. The knocking came again, the same three sharp raps. Standing frozen by the wood stove, I pictured the night outside, the last stretch of road to the house so narrow, the snow six feet deep, the passage like a bobsled run, the darkness mitigated only by the stars. The only people I'd seen in the nearby hills, apart from Nat and his son, who occasionally came to plow the unmaintained lane, were deer hunters. But hunting season was months gone. The winter sun had long since set. Whoever was at the door had to be more frightened than I was. If there was a crazy man in the woods, a wild bearded loner liable to do anything, I was him. I am the crazy man. I am the crazy man. It was the same thing I had told myself so many times hearing a branch snap in the woods or the stairs creak in the middle of the night. I am the crazy man. I am the crazy man. Usually it hardened my fear into something like resolve. But now I couldn't help picturing a middle-aged man in a checked wool jacket slouching at the door, a glowing cigarette in one hand, a rifle in the other, and no deer for miles. The three raps came again, more insistent. It was probably an emergency. Someone was probably in need. Smoke was rising from my chimney. Candlelight spilled out onto the snow. There really wasn't much of a choice. I stepped into my moccasins, crossed the plywood mudroom floor, and opened the door. So I'm not going to tell you who was <laughs> at the door. You do eventually find out. <laughs> but not for a couple hundred pages. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so as I mentioned in that, in that section, there was, there was an accident, and I had, been, I, I had been blinded in my right eye. That happened when I was 20. I was a junior at college, and it was right before the end of junior year. It was just a couple weeks before exams. Um, and I had gone to play some pickup basketball. That's, that's something I did when I wanted to relax. It's a place where I felt very much like myself. I had played uh, for the team in high school, and I played a lot growing up. And it was just a freak accident. There was a loose ball, and I was charging for it, as was this other boy, and his finger went into my eye, and it went in very deeply and curved behind my eye and disconnected or severed the connection between my optic nerve, which is the cable that connects the, the eye to the brain. So I was instantly blinded in my, in my right eye. And um, there were a number of uh, ramifications. I mean, one is that I lost depth perception. The other is that I lost some peripheral vision on my right-hand side. But the biggest thing, I, I think, was that I was suddenly outside the track of my own life. I, I was just writing an essay this morning and thinking about it again, um, how after the accident I had to take a cab down to the Mass Eye and Ear Infirmary here in Boston. Um, and it was at rush hour, so we got stuck in traffic. And my, my eye was dripping. Sorry for the gory details. It was bad. I was in a lot of pain, and there was a lot of blood. And, um, but I was just stuck in traffic. And there was nothing I could do, and the cab couldn't go any faster. And the first doctor I'd seen at Harvard University Health Services um, had completely misdiagnosed me and tried to send me back to my dorm room. He just said, oh, you just have a shiner. You know, it'll be fine. Once your eye opens, no, not to worry. And I had to tell him when you actually sh shown your pen light in my eye, you know, he pried open my eyelids and I couldn't see any, I couldn't even see light. I couldn't see anything. So at that point he said, oh, you know, take a cab, go to the, go to the hospital. <laughs> he wouldn't get me an ambulance. So I was stuck in traffic and Stuck in traffic on, I was across the Charles, so that's, what is that, Soldiers Field Road, I guess? Um, and for what, we were stuck, so I could just, I remember looking across the river at all of the Harvard buildings lined up like this model city, you know, the, the, the spires and the bricks. And I was supposed to be at a meeting in about half an hour, then I was supposed to go to dinner, I was supposed to meet a friend, and I had this very strange feeling of being aware of my life still going on on that side of the, of, of the river but going on without me, kind of like a shadow in my place, going to the meeting and then going to dinner. And I was outside of that track, you know, that, a track that I had never really questioned and a track that I had done a lot of work to be on. Um, and so it, after going to the hospital and after 
um, being able to go back to college, I still didn't really feel like I was back on that track. I was now permanently outside that track. And I think having a change in my visual perception continually reminded me that things were different, that, that what I had assumed to be um, reality, what I had assumed to be my own identity, all of those things were more up for, up for question than I had previously imagined. And I think it was that distance, that suddenly not being on this track, which in a lot of ways had substituted achievement for meaning. I mean, I hadn't really had to think about what's going to be important, what's meaningful, because if I kept getting good grades and doing well, I was going to go to law school, and meaning seemed to be sort of ready, you know, prefabricated. You succeed, you've achieved, you've done well. You don't really have to think about these things. But suddenly, I was off that track, um, had sort of been thrown off that track, and I was asking all those questions. And as I was 20 years old, I mean, I think it's interesting that you, you, know, you, you, you were 22 or 23 when, when your dad died. I mean, it, it's a time when you're already asking all those questions. Who am I going to be? Uh, where do I find meaning? And so for me, I, I was just, all those questions just suddenly became less abstract, more immediate, um, and more necessary for me to answer in my, own, in my own way. And a few years later, when I was 25, there's more to it than that, but that's the quick summary. When I was 25, I went to live in the woods. And, um, and I, it's hard when you don't necessarily know what you're searching for exactly or how to go about finding it. But I did know that I wanted to sort of clear out everything from that track beforehand, basically clear out everything and just sort of see what happens when uh, you take away all the parts of your identity that are roles that you play for other people. When you take away all the parts of, of your life that are sort of prefabricated by tracks. What happens if you remove everything and sort of go to zero and just live in a, in a wild place um, and take things slowly, what starts to come back? What starts to fill in? What, if you take out everything, then do you want to add back to your life? So that's more or less what I was up to. And um, I want to read one more very short section to, just to show how the, the most basic things, and this was just having tea in the morning after putting um, wood in the wood stove, the most basic things suddenly could bring up questions, suddenly could give you a different, or give me a different way of thinking about things that I'd never really thought about before. And in this case, one of the things I'm starting to become more aware of is time, and how constructed time is in our daily lives, and how there are other ways of thinking about time. So, so I've woken up, I can see my breath because it's so cold. I go down, I put some wood in the wood stove, I put the tea on, um, and that's, that's where we are. I took my time. The loneliness often felt as though the day was slow, and I was stuck outside that slowness, looking in. The way to feel less lonely was to slow down to the day's pace, to be inside it, and to look around from there. The clean, almost sharp waft of mint would cool behind my eyes, mint tea, sorry. With each hot sip, there was the compliment of the wood smoke on my hands, as though I'd brewed the tea over a peat fire. Behind me, the wood popped, shifted, hissed. I can't say how long any of this took. Maybe 10 minutes drinking the cup of tea, maybe longer. There was no clock in the house, no microwave numerals, no computer. No sense of time other than the daylight through the windows and my own sense of pattern. Finding my hand on the kettle, just as it began to tremble, or stepping outside to find the sun, a white hole in the clouds above the highest spruce. There had always been clocks in classrooms, clocks on walls, clocks in public spaces, clocks like the digital one above Alban Pan and Harvard Square, or the famous clock tower in Piazza Maggiore, clocks as ubiquitous as the portraits in China of Chairman Mao or of Lenin in Russia, not to mention the watches on nearly every wrist in Harvard Yard, individual watches to make time's face resemble your own, while we were all joined by common time, the common progression, which we were assured of by the bells tolling at one church or another. There was undoubtedly something true about it. The light did come and go, the sun did rise and set, the moon did change its shape in the sky, and meanwhile we all got older, 
Time passed. I'd never given it much thought, but now it seemed bizarre that we'd managed to shrink something so profoundly primal and complex, something near, so near and so far, into little circular frames with numbers up to 12. It was like we had domesticated the planetary motions, housed them in convenient cages, harnessed them as farm animals to help with our daily work. We needed them for lunch meetings. We needed them for parking meters. Every night, we slipped the turning of the Earth from our wrists. The few stars in Boston, I realize now, have been like worn-out horses back in their stalls, their quiet snuffling in the dark, their unassuming beauty, so much greater than the use to which they'd been put. But here, the stars ran wild. With the overwhelming profusion of them, with the visible sweep of the Milky Way, it seemed there were more stars than sky. Time was everywhere. Not minutes and hours, not days and weeks, but seasons, centuries, millennia. Time was so much bigger in wild places. And feeling them reunited, time and space, I felt returned to some natural element, like a fish returned to water. Thanks. Um, one thing I'm wondering, um, Howie, I, I read your book, I read both books, I enjoyed them both very much. I'm just wondering, um, when you were in the woods, were you keeping journals and then used them later to, um, to draw on for material, or how did that, could you tell a little bit about how that process worked? Thank you. So at the beginning, when I was first in the woods, I, I was keeping a journal a little bit, but um, it began to feel strange to me because I was, I was so far away from words. I wasn't talking to anybody. I wasn't listening to any voices. I stopped reading fairly soon. I would read a little bit, maybe a page or two at night. But in that quiet, words started to feel um, in, invasive almost. And I, I guess the other part was that I, um, I was very far away from narrative because Usually in a day or in a week, if, you, if something happens, you might start thinking about, even while it's happening, especially now with social media, but you might be thinking about how will I tell this to my friend, or this is a great story, or I can't believe this is happening, or, but with no prospect of talking to anyone that night or that week or that month, I, didn't, I stopped thinking that way. And so then to write in a journal at night felt odd. It, felt, it did feel very constructed, as though I was trying to make that narrative for myself. And as so much of what I wanted to get away from was any constructed sense of myself, it, it felt like I shouldn't be making notes where I would start, even if the, the reader was just an imagined version of myself in the future. So I, I, stopped, I stopped taking notes or, or keeping a journal. So then when I went to write, of course, I was at a disadvantage because I didn't have, I didn't have all those notes. But in some ways, I was at an advantage because during my time in the woods, I, there had been no other, uh, no other voices. There had been nothing else going on. I mean, it was, it's hard to explain just how quiet it was. And so my memory, so my attention was different than it would be, you know, if you're just surrounded by all kinds of things. And my memory was different than it would be if you're surrounded by all kinds of things. So the walk that I went on, for instance, every morning, which was maybe a mile and a half or a two-mile walk, is very easy for me to recreate in my mind, not only because I did it every day, but because while I was doing it, I generally wasn't thinking about anything. I was just paying attention to the way I saw, to the way I heard, watching the snow, listening to the birds. Um, and so I can recreate that walk almost tree by tree, not almost tree by tree, in, in my mind. So the, the, to recall the physical details was actually very easy and um, pleasurable. I mean, maybe you had more of a mix because you were talking about going into the underworld and the, the difficulty of going in and not knowing what'll happen, you know, if you'll be able to make it out or sort of the, the impact of being down there. And for me, the, I mean, there were some very hard parts about going back in or thinking about the eye accident or some of the impact on my family. I mean, there were elements that were, I was nervous about going back into, but to get to spend time in the woods again, with such a pleasure, and I, I, mean, I remember times when I was writing in the summer, and I'd, I'd spend the morning, you know, two hours writing some, uh, invariably, this, it was snowing in the, in, the, in the scene, and then I'd walk outside and really be astounded that it, 
it was warm out and that it wasn't snow. Just like look around and think, how did this? Because I'd gone so fully back to the woods and it had been such a comfort to go back to the woods. And I, yeah, I was really intrigued by what you said about how it, just how, how dangerous it sometimes felt. And I, I guess if other people have questions, but I, I have a question, just sort of, were there things you did to protect yourself psychically or just that you, hand, sort of hand holds that you had as you went so you knew you'd be able to find your way back, back up? Well, I think what was hard was having the space um, because the day would be sort of chopped up in that I would go to the library in the morning and work there till the afternoon, and then I'd have to pick up my children and make dinner. And it was such a different headspace. Um, so at times I would go in and I would discover something I hadn't expected to discover or have an emotional reaction I hadn't expected to have. And I kind of needed space to, um, to have it there and not take it with me. Um, and I sort of, looking back, wish that I had kind of had done more retreats, um, uh, you know, to, to have more space to kind of let stuff process and go through me, just so that I'd be br breathing it out. I mean, I think exercise was really important, <clears throat> and just having a way of, of working out some of what I was discovering, because sometimes even when you go over a past you think you know very well, you find things you, that are shocking to the system or that sort of sit with you in an uncomfortable way. Um, so, you know, I, I think self-care of exercise or therapy, you know, or talking to people was, was really important. But in a way, I was sort of, I couldn't go, I was prevented from going too, too deep at a constant level because I had these, the family too. Mm. For both of you, was this, were these your first published books? And if so, where did you learn how to write so well? What was that process? You no, that you, go, you go first. <laughs> <laughs> I had been circling around my book for 20 years. So, um, you know, it was scary to write it. I, I needed it to be perfect, which meant it was unwritable. Um, I had false starts. I couldn't get enough distance, you know. Um, so I, I published a, a couple of essays related to my story first, which helped me um, focus a little bit what some of the big themes were. I also did an MFA program. Go MFA program. <laughs> um, but actually, it was 10 years before I got my book published that I did the MFA program. So that wasn't the, didn't sort of solve the riddle exactly, but it did give me a lot of material <clears throat> that I later worked with. Um, but I'm really glad that I started doing writing about the story soon after the events had taken place. So in a way, I was taking notes on my memory. Just sometimes I would write, I remember, I remember, just collect things like, you know, snatches of fabric and bead that you would later use for some special quilt. And you're like, I don't know, this, is, this will come in handy maybe. And so that by the time I was ready and had the book contract and, and the space to really sort of take it on seriously, which at different times in my life I didn't have the ability to do, I had some material already to work with. Um, so that, that helped me. I'd done a lot of writing, it's this, so this is my first book, but I'd done a lot of writing beforehand. I, even before the accident, I secretly, underneath the, the law school track, I wanted to be a writer, and I was taking some creative writing classes in college, and um, and even published a few things right out of college. And so I, I had I had been writing beforehand, and um, and I did spend a year in an MFA program for fiction, um, and then dropped out. Uh, but my teacher there, Ron Carlson, said something great. He said, and I think it certainly applies to memoir. He said. You don't want to tell the story of your near drowning until you're on dry land, and I, I think it's su such a helpful. And there's so it's such a, there's so many parts to that advice. I mean, one is why not? You know, what happens if you try to tell it too early, and how it can only exacerbate the drowning? 
but also how you know if you're close enough to dry land or you're on dry land but you're not yet fully dry maybe that's the time to do it it, it's, it can sort of help you feel more grounded on dry land help you dry off a little bit it's still fresh enough that you know what you're talking about um, there's a lot in that in that piece of advice so I suppose that's I mean even though I dropped out of that program uh, just paying attention to, to pieces of advice like that trying to cobble together my own uh, way of thinking about writing and, and what I was ready to do. And then I did go back to an MFA program for poetry, actually, but I don't know how I enjoyed it. I don't know how much it, it helped. It was really more of a halfway house after I came out of the woods. Just a, I went in Arizona. It was just a place to ride my bike and swim and be in the company of nice people who like to talk about books. Um, but there are because they're Grub Street people in the audience, and we both teach there. There, there are classes in Boston at Grub Street uh, for people who are working on, on, on books, and that can be really helpful just to have the company of peers, to get feedback from uh, instructors, and to know that that struggle t to write is, because it, it's so hard to feel rewarded for it, I think, in your daily life, every time you sit down, and, and it can really kick your ass. So to be among other people, who are going through some of that same struggle and value, the process as, as you do can, can be really useful. How do you um, decide, I liked what you said about not really knowing what you're looking for or how to look for it. And um, so in that context, I was wondering how you decided to do something so deliberate as go into the Northern Vermont woods and how you found a beautiful place like that that was so unreachable. <clears throat> and then the second part, is um, again in reference to the um, you know you're not, not sure what you're looking for or, or how to look for it. Um, how did you end up in the in the end deciding to write a book about this? So thank you. Okay, so I I found the house just practically. I found the house by by having a picture in my mind of the kind of house where I wanted the kind of land where I wanted to live, and then I I went around northern Vermont. I, I wrote a note. I, have, I can't draw at all. Otherwise, I would have drawn it because I could see it very clearly, but I can barely do stick figures. So I, I wrote a description of what I was looking for and posted it on bulletin boards outside general stores all in lots of towns in northern Vermont, thinking I would get, there would just be a flurry of, <laughs> of offers. And only one guy called, and that was, it was that house. Um, and how did I decide to do something like that? I, I was this very strange combination at the time. So I was, I was still very confident. I mean, I had generally succeeded at whatever I'd tried. I was, so I was very confident, but I was also very lost. And that's an un, unusual combination. And that combination can lead towards people doing extreme things, which is what I, which is what I did. And I, I just knew I needed to be someplace quiet and far away and someplace where my senses, where I could sort of sink back into my senses and learn to see again, learn to hear again. Um, and the last part about why I decided to write the book, I, I never had any intention of writing about this. Uh, I didn't think anyone would be particularly interested. I didn't think I would know how to talk about it and um, it wasn't something I wanted to do. And, and I also hadn't read a lot of memoirs. I read mostly fiction and poetry. But I, uh, I had an article in the New York Times Magazine about a tennis player, a comeback story, a guy who broke his neck uh, and then came back and played. And, and an editor at Random House saw it and sent me an email and said, do you want to write a book? And I said, no, I just wrote this, I just researched this guy for six months and I, I mean, I'm sick of writing, like he was great, but I don't want to write. And he said, no, 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 I meant I like your sentences, I like your, do you want to write a book? And then we started talking. And I, he wanted me to be like Tracy Kidder. He wanted me to find some story. And, and I kept looking for some story. And eventually, sort of hopelessly, I said to him, well, I did, you know, months later. I did live in the woods for two years. <laughs> and he, he was interested. So then we started talking. And that uh, I eventually realized that maybe there was a story worth telling, and that, and that also it would be that I actually needed to tell it. Part of why I hadn't been able to find my Tracy Kidder story was with each thing that popped up, I was afraid that I would superimpose my story onto whatever that story was, instead of doing the necessary work of just getting rid of my story, even if it wasn't gonna be that interesting, so that then I could be freed up to 
really to write you know, about someone else. Let's give them a great round of applause. Yes. This was in the middle of the 1980s, before cell phones, and when the beige telephone next to my bed rang and it was my husband, my mother could tell, I'm sure, by the pitiful way I said hi, as though ready to weep.